It's done. It's finally done. I managed to turn this component into a simulation model. I mean, you would think that turning a DC brushed motor into a model is nothing complicated. I thought so too. But boy was I wrong. I wasn't really aware about how complex and detailed DC motor simulation was. That's until I saw a video from a very angry man talking about it. He explains in a very informative way about how the DC motor works. Then I started searching, how does everybody else model a motor? And I came across this website. There are people actually manufacture motors, so they should know a thing or two about this. So I tried, I really did, but I couldn't figure out how to link all the constants to real components and how to extract all the parameters. So I decided to start over in a step-by-step -step approach. So this will be the basic model that I start with. I removed all the inductances to simplify the circuit and it now only contains our DC resistance of the motor coil and the mechanical losses. Basically we just need this information, so we need the input voltage, the zero load current and our DC resistance of the motor. So this is all that mathematical modeling turned into a simulation model. I got my supply voltage, the motor's internal resistance, our EMF voltage which is linked to the mechanical circuit, both of these being behavioral voltage sources, and then we got another resistor to represent our internal loss. Now if we run this we will see that although we have a nice 12 volt supply, our EMF voltage, so the energy stored inside the motor, is a bit lower, and this value will be proportional to the internal loss. So what happens if we also want to add an output to the motor, so to link something to it? Well, we need to add some extra load into our mechanical circuit. And we can do this by adding another voltage source, whose current will be dependent on the current on the output. And we can add this constant that represents the motor's rotation. So to turn whatever current we had here into a voltage proportional to the output speed. We can say that one RPM is one volt. So let's see what this thing does. We see that our output it is going at 3400 something volts, which represents RPM. We still have the same 12 volts input, but now if we check our EMF voltage, we see that it's much lower. It's now only 8 volts. Previously, it was somewhere around 11. So the more energy that is being taken out of the circuit, the lower the EMF voltage will be. Also, we can see how efficient our motor is. We can simply check the output power, 2.6 watts, and we can check the input power, which is about 5 watts. So we just created the model for a very inefficient motor, wasting almost 50% of the input power. Things were going well, but it was time to add the time-dependent behaviors caused by internal inductances and inertia. But first I had to check the real thing, just to make sure that I'm on the right path. So first thing I want to test is the inrush current of my motor. So for that I got the setup, I'm using a 12 volt power supply and I got my oscilloscope setup on the first channel to test the input voltage and on the second channel to test the current going through the motor. And for that I'm actually going to use the current probe I built in my very first video. So let's see how this thing works out. So we can see that although the motor which is currently running is using only 30 milliamps, the initial inrush current, right here this spike, reached about 1.3 volts meaning 1.3 amps. So a very small current motor, 30 milliamp motor, actually draws more than one amp when turning on. Now you may be wondering, is this current realistic? I mean, why is it so large? Well actually, this initial inrush current is the motor stall current. This current is coming from the DC resistance of the coil. Basically in stall condition, when the speed is zero, the motor is not rotating, the EMF voltage is also zero. So the only thing limiting our input current is the DC resistance of the motor. Nothing else stands in the path of the current. Now during startup, if the motor will start slow enough, our current will actually reach this peak current. Once the motor starts turning, the current will drop down since our EMF voltage will start to rise. On the other hand, if our motor turns on much faster, then we will not reach this current. So we will be on one of these lower curves. Now, does the current jump directly to the peak current? Well, actually no. The slope of the current rise is dictated by the inductance of the motor coil. As you know, the inductor opposes the change of current when the voltage is applied. So you cannot get 
a peak current directly over an inductor. A certain amount of time needs to pass before that. Now the next thing to be added is the mechanical inertia, so this inductor in the mechanical circuit, and the electrical inductance, so the inductance of the motor winding. So how does this affect our circuit? We can already see that something is different because the simulation is running much slower. And now if we look at the current through the motor, we see this spike right at the beginning. This shows how the motor starts up, so it needs a bit of energy to start turning. And we can also see the same thing if we look at the RPM on the output. So we see that it has a nice acceleration period, and when it's turned off it has a nice deceleration period. So all of these are caused by the mechanical inertia. Now if we just look at the voltage on the motor, we can see that it's cl quite clean. So we have a DC voltage going and turning on our motor. But is there anything hidden inside that? So I played around with the settings of the oscilloscope a bit, still measuring the exact same thing, but right now I'm measuring with AC coupling and about 200 millivolts per division. And we see these nice little spikes appearing. And you can see that these spikes are appearing at regular intervals. We can actually measure the time between them, which amounts to 1.6 milliseconds or a frequency of 625 hertz. So where are these spikes coming from? Well, their origins can be explained if we look closer at how the motor itself is built. So inside the motor we have three coils built on the rotor. And then we got a couple of brushes which contact the rotor enabling it to rotate. Now the way the motor actually rotates is by supplying the coils one after the other. So we got six possible ways in which to supply the free coils. And during one complete rotation the motor will go through all of these six combinations. Now if we look closer at this rotor assembly we can see that there's a small gap between two of these plates. So for a short amount of time no coil is actually supplied. And that's when those spikes happen. Now if we say that 60 rotations per minute is equivalent to one rotation per second and that during one complete rotation we've got six of these transitions then we can say that 10 rotations per minute correspond to one coil transition. In other words if we know the frequency of the transitions we can multiply that by 10 and end up with the speed of the motor. We can work out that this motor is turning at 6,250 RPM. So from this noise information we can actually deduce what the speed of the motor is. But how on earth do you turn a voltage into a coil interruption? How can I simulate that the motor is turning? So to reproduce the switching behavior of the coils, I added this voltage controlled oscillator. Basically it takes the output speed information, so the voltage, turns it into a current and is charging a capacitor. Once the capacitor is charged, I'm using this flip-flop to discharge it, which I'm also using to switch on and off the supply to the motor. Also I added some resistance and inductance to show a realistic supply line, and I also added the small capacitance over the switch. So let's see how this thing behaves. First, let's see our capacitor. So you can see that it's charging faster and faster, depending on the speed of our motor. Now if we look at our input voltage, we see that we have all these spikes appearing. So we got our base 12 volts, but we have all these inductive spikes caused from the switching action of our motor. Another interesting thing is, if we look at the current, we see that it no longer starts in a nice arc and then falls down, it's actually extremely choppy. This is again caused by the switching action of our motor. And this is exactly the behavior we can see in real life. So this was gonna be the last experiment to show how perfect the model is. I couldn't have been more wrong. So just to show how well the model is working, I had done this setup as a final experiment. I've got two identical motors with their shafts interconnected. I'm going to supply one motor with my power supply and I'm going to measure the voltage on the other motor using a standard multimeter. So let's see what happens. So we see that the first motor is drawing roughly twice the current that it was initially drawing when it was on its own and the output voltage is roughly 11.3 volts. But what does this voltage look like? Let's just quickly look at it with the oscilloscope, it's probably continuous and nothing interesting is gonna happen. Wait, is my... something wrong with my connection? Why is this thing oscillating? 
I mean, there's no spikes, it's just oscillating. I think there's something wrong with my model, since my model will not create any sort of oscillations at the moment. Ah, back to the drawing board. So, to see where this is coming from, we need again to study how the motor itself is built. So, as we said, we got the coils on our rotor, we've got our brushes, but we also have a fixed magnetic field given by the magnets inside the motor. Now what happens if you take one coil and rotate it in a fixed magnetic field? Well, you're gonna get the voltage over the coil that looks like a sine wave, depending on the angle between the coil and the magnetic field. Now because during one complete rotation the coil gets rotated in regards to the terminals, the output voltage, if we would have only one coil, would be like a rectified sine wave. Now in reality, motor contains three of these coils at 120 degrees one from the other. So the sine waves produced by each of these coils will be 120 degrees phase shifted one from another. And if we add all of these up, we're gonna end up with something like this. We've got three sine waves rectified and 120 degrees out of phase one from the other. And during one complete rotation, we end up having the six transitions from one to the other. Now since these coils are only connected to the terminals for a slight amount of time, our output voltage ends up looking like this. So we've got a small little bumpy output voltage. Basically it looks like 6 phase AC rectified. Just like we got on our oscilloscope. So I had to scrap the old voltage controlled oscillator and this is the final circuit that I came up with. To obtain the oscillation of the EMF voltage source, I took the current going through the mechanical circuit, used it to charge a capacitor and based on the voltage on this capacitor, I'm creating a sine wave using the sine function. Now to simulate the three out of phase motors, I added three of these voltage sources and the only difference in their formulas is this phase shift term. So the second one has 2 pi divided by 3 added and the third one has 4 pi divided by 3. So we get this 120 degree offset. Then I took the maximum of the three voltages to obtain the nice rectified voltage and finally I added this spark parameter to simulate the interruptions caused by changing from one coil to the other. And I took the continuous voltage, so the rectified voltage which goes up to a maximum value of 1 and multiplied it by the current through the mechanical circuit to obtain the EMF voltage. And then I took the other voltage, the one with the sparks, to drive the switch. And another thing that I added is this spark gap, well actually it's a diac circuit, so this will simulate the sparks that happen inside the motor when it's turning, so when it's going from one coil to the other. And to simulate the circuit that we've just seen, I added another motor with exactly the same characteristics, built in the same way, and I took the two connections from the two motors here. So right now I can supply one of the motors and check the voltage on the other. So let's see if this looks anything like what we saw on our oscilloscope. So we can already see this oscillation and once the output voltage stabilized we can see that the average is roughly 11.25. So very close to what we saw in our practical experiment. Also the current going into the first motor is around 56 milliamps. So to see how the EMF voltage is working, first of all we can see the current going through our mechanical circuit which is increasing depending on the speed of our motor and Therefore we can see the voltage on our capacitor also increasing but also the slope is increasing based on the current going through it. So the higher the current, the faster the charging rate. Now taking this information, I ended up creating the free sine waves. And then my next voltage source takes only the peak values from these. And the final voltage source creates these interruptions when going from one coil to the other. Now just to make sure that this thing is working as it should, let's try something else. Let's add a load to the second motor to see how this influences the circuit. So now we can see that the output voltage is lower, so now it's around 9.5 volts. We can see that the input current is higher, around 146 milliamps, and also we can see the speed at which the motors are turning is lower. So before it was around 6500 rpm, now it's around 6100 rpm. This will be my final experiment part 2. I've got the same motor to motor connection and just like we simulated I'm going to add a resistive load to see how this impacts the system. So first of all we can notice that the sound the motors are making has changed. We can see this in the oscilloscope that the speed of the motor has changed. 
Also the output waveform is a bit different, the output voltage is lower and the input current is higher. So we can see that this load has direct effect on how the motors function and it's pulling energy from the input. Now, the exact values are not quite what they were in the simulation, but this is also because my measuring equipment is not the most precise, my components are not exactly ideal, and my two motors are not perfectly identical. But we can clearly see that the model is predicting quite close to reality what is happening. And this concludes my video about DC motors. Of course there's much more things to talk about, like how to drive the motors and so on, but that's a topic for a different time. So, hope you got some useful information out of this, leave your thoughts in the comments, thank you for watching, and see you next time. Bye bye!